Good morning, and welcome back to Rossetti's In Relations. I'm Nicholas Dunn McAfee from the University of York, and it gives me great pleasure to open the second day. Welcome back to those who were here yesterday, and welcome to those for whom this is the first day. Before I start today's panel, the first of three, followed by an in conversation later, I just want to say a thank you to our speakers from last night, who gave wonderful gallery talks during the private view. They were, in no particular order, Debbie Hicks, Suzanne Fajans Cooper, Megan Williams, Helen Bratt Wyatt, Witten, sorry, Mark Samuels Lasner, Amy Griffin, and Gabriella Macaro. Thank you very much for your time and energies last night. So, to today's first panel, provocatively titled Close Reading. Perhaps the most generative way of thinking about close reading, the act of close reading, is to see it as an act of slow reading, or, as many of us were doing last night, unrushed viewing of artwork. A deliberate attempt to detach ourselves from the sometimes overwhelming macro-level narrative or power of an artwork, and pay real attention to the precise effects of an interplay between a literary work's language, imagery, illusion, and syntax, or a visual work's color, composition, line, and perspective. The practice of close reading is something we rather take for granted in the disciplines of art history and English literature. Whatever other sorts of critical activities they may flamboyantly display, we expect scholars to do close reading, to be close readers. And what unites the three papers on this panel, then, is a promise. A promise to spend the time and attention necessary to deliver careful, sustained interpretations of literary works and visual works. Close attention, of course, brings about a form of electrifying defamiliarization. It has the power to break through our habitual, casual, careless and less attentive engagement with and preconceived notions about well-known works of art. As before, we'll be having the three papers together, so please hold your questions and curiosity to the very end. Also, as before, I won't read out their impressively intimidating biographies and indicators of esteem, which are all available in full on the Paul Mellon Center's website. Our first speaker today is Thomas Hughes, Associate Lecturer at the Courtauld, with his paper, Transformation in Dante Gabriel Rossetti's La Galandata in relation to Christina Rossetti. I'd like to welcome Thomas to the podium. Oh, thank you very much, Nicholas. Good morning, everyone. And it's very good to be here. So that's the title of the paper. As Emma Mason and Dinah Rowe have argued, the other than human plays significant roles in Christina Rossetti's poetics and theology. The way that nature, plants and animals, take part in her conception of grace. Her poems offer, among other things, an enormous synthesis of the many diverse beings of creation. Beings, including, in Rossetti's Processional of Creation of 1881, for example, angels, spring and autumn, a rose, a lily, an apple, a vine, and birds. These diverse beings are given voices in this poem in three-line lyrics, and therefore a kind of agency. And also these diverse beings are lent a kind of equality of standing, or maybe in the parlance of contemporary ecological theory, a flat ontology. The rose and autumn and angels being able to speak with comparable voices. 
And this extends, as Emma Mason points out, and as will become important for my argument later on, to the human genders, man and woman. The importance to Christina Rossetti's poetics and theology of other than human animacy gives me one vector along which to explore potential relations between this body of work and that of her brother, Dante Gabriel. Specifically, this picture, which has held me captive for the last year or so, Le Gill and Data of 1873. As I have been close looking at this picture at the Guildhall Art Gallery and subsequently here at Tate, and as I've been writing about it and researching its production, context and reception, I have come to the conviction that the main figure in this picture evades fixed genders. The curious temporality of the painting, an ongoingness without narrative, a stretching of time, but also an anticipation. The picture is held on the moment of something happening, the string about to be pulled, the music about to be heard. This curious temporality suggests or evokes an interpretation whereby the figure is felt to be capable of actually transforming before our eyes, is paradoxically pictured in the ongoing act of transformation, even. The more one looks, the more one sees that transformation of one kind or another is actually suggested wherever one looks across the surface of the canvas. In some sense, the figure and the harp, or musical instrument, are one entity. The instrument emanates from the figure's shoulder. Its strings emerge from and disappear into its long red hair. Once this human harp transformation is perceived, one comes to see that the plants or the bower is also part of this amalgamated entity. And what of all those hands, in particular these ones, also this one? Do they belong to the angels and the figure? Or do they possibly, in one way of viewing this strange and enchanting painting, emerge from inside the bower itself? With these possibilities of human harp hedge transformation of disembodied body parts and animate human non-human creatures, the idea of the monstrous is raised. And for the rest of this chapter, I'll essentially be thinking through the radical possibilities of this aesthetic category, building on queer and trans theory. But first, this idea of the monstrous provides me with a way to focus my exploration of the possibilities of relation between Dante Gabriel and Christina. Rather than focus on some aspect of creation afforded animacy by Christina, such as angels or birds, and I could have done this given brother and sister shared access to a menagerie of exotic animals, but rather than do that, I focus on the implications of Christina Rossetti's move to indiscriminately grant all of creation agency and a role in grace. Even in Emma Mason's very word, the monstrous. And I quote Emma Mason now. By including even ostensibly monstrous aspects of creation in grace, Christina precedes eco-feminists like Carolyn Merchant, Donna Haraway, and Val Plumwood, who explore kinship models of relationship with reference to the whole as a symbol of environmental solidarity, end quote. And I would probably say coexistence as well, or instead of 
solidarity. At this point, we need, of course, to consider Victorian receptions of Rossetti's picture. And I am not the only one to identify as an effect of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's work, the ostensibly monstrous. In his review of the retrospective dedicated to Dante Gabriel at the Royal Academy after the latter's death, in an essay first published in 1883, Walter Pater wrote of the, quote, really imaginative vividness of Rossetti's personifications. Rossetti's hold upon them, or rather their hold upon him, with the force of a Frankenstein, when once they have taken life from him, end quote. Well, this description of Pater's is typically condensed and suggestive. The literary critic, eco-theorist, Timothy Morton, has recently pointed out that Mary Shelley's creature actually typifies what becomes the post-Darwin conception of a life form. As Darwin observes in The Descent of Man of 1871, at a still earlier period, Darwin writes, the progenitors of man must have been aquatic in their habits, for morphology plainly tells us that our lungs consist of a modified swim bladder, which once served as a float. A curious thought, and one of many such observations. So looked at one way, Darwin implies, all creatures are made up of organic components from creatures different to themselves. We are all assemblies, all the way down, as Morton puts it, of other life forms, parts. In this way, to paraphrase, paraphrase Morton, Darwin is led to admit that mutation and monstrosity are the same thing. There is a haunting spectral quality to our realization, reading Darwin, that nature essentially consists of assemblage and reanimation, and that organic being therefore hovers between emerging life and death, monstrosity and reanimation. All of these things, I think, are suggestive ways to inform our close looking of Ligel and Data. And Morton is not the only person to write about Darwin like this. Sam C. has also suggested that beneath his heteronormative veneer, Darwin's, Darwin describes other than human and also human life as a process of ongoing vivid transformations activated by erotic and aesthetic drives in nature. Wondrous metamorphosis, as Darwin puts it in his Voyages of the Beagle, an early text from 1839. So turning back to Le Gill and Data, in extending wondrous metamorphosis to include technology, the musical instrument, and therefore art itself. Rossetti, I argue, is suggesting a natural basis for aestheticism. So really, I use close looking of this picture through a, a queer ecology lens to suggest um, uh, quite a significant rereading of later 19th century British culture. Walter Pater, it must be said, is ostensibly writing about Rossetti's paintings and poetry as a whole. But his comment can be taken as a response, in part, to Le Gill and Data, which did hang at that Royal Academy exhibition. That said, Pater's characterization of Rossetti's response to Darwin, in terms of the Frankensteinian, the monstrous even, only goes so far for me when looking at this picture itself. The pale glowing figure is enchanting and also bloodless. It is a far cry from the blood curdling romantic Gothic of Mary Shelley. 
Ligil and data is characterized everywhere by very different effects of delicacy and the merging of forms. Pater's description, however, strongly resonates with Susan Stryker's celebrated move to reclaim the idea of Frankensteinian monstrosity from transphobia in an article published in 1994, quite a long time ago now, entitled, My Words to Victor Frankenstein Above the Village of Chamonix. In the face of abusive charges from transphobes that subjects such as Stryker are against nature, the category of the monstrous can be redeployed to, to subvert the distinction between natural and unnatural, in just the way Darwin, Pater, and arguably Rossetti also suggest. In 2019, more recently, Stryker pointed out that her Frankenstein article remained the second most read article in GLQ, a journal of lesbian and gay studies, attesting to the continued generativeness of its arguments and also its generation of important critiques, particularly or notably in terms of race. And this also attests, by the way, to the strange ongoing power of Shelley's tale to provoke poignant ontological reflections. Pater clearly felt this potential in Shelley's tale too. I'm looking at Rossetti. Before I move towards a conclusion, a general word about transformation in Christina before bringing it back to the specific angle I have been pursuing. On the one hand, if I may be permitted to make this generalization, I would say that for Christina, transformation is in some sense a future event. It will take place at apocalypse and revelation. The root for her to transformation is ecology. But her poems actually intimate this full transformation to come as taking place in the present tense and in the here and now, as in the sonnet beginning, I quote, Tread softly, all the earth is holy ground. It may be, could we but look with seeing eyes, this spot we stand on is a paradise, where dead have come to life and lost been found. Well, could we say that Dante Gabriel gives us the eyes we need to see paradise? Le Ghirlandata is, however, more looped, more wholly present tense. Transformation, as I said at the beginning, is pictured as ongoing, taking part in a realm involving both the transcendental but also the physical. It's very much about physical matter and our bodies, I think. A realm that we might characterize as involving both the waking world and the dream. Perhaps there is a general and very old distinction to draw here then, one of medium that has been schematized by Lessing and others, poetry's diachronic and painting's synchronic temporalities, which Christina and Dante Gabriel respectively bend to their distinct but intimately related creative wills. So, drawing to a conclusion, with Stryker's article, we come to see in Rossetti's painting, in surprisingly fresh and vivid ways, that the monstrous is in fact no such thing. And this is where we get to a place that chimes, for me, with the spirit of Christina Rossetti's beguilingly modest ontologically poignant poetry. That we are all amalgamated entities undergoing transformations for however much time we have to spend here. 
all individual creatures within an all-pervasive, wondrous creatureliness. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, for that Paterian level of care and attention. Our second speaker today is Marta Stinnis, a research associate with the University of York and the Netherlands Institute for Art History. She recently completed a postdoctoral fellowship with the Paul Mellon Centre. With her paper, tantalizingly titled Love and Longing, Intermedial Relationships Between Painting and Music in the 1850s, I'd like to welcome Marta. Hello, everyone. I am delighted to be here. I don't know. Too tall? No, fine. Okay. Um, my name is on... I thought, I thought I forgot to put my name on the slides, but it's all perfect. Uh, hi. Welcome. Uh, today in my talk, I want to focus on the interdisciplinary relationship in the work of Elizabeth Siddle and Dante Gabriel Rossetti. Using Siddle's Lovers Listening to Music as a starting point, I want to have a closer look at the music painting developments surrounding both Siddle and Rossetti in the 1850s. By identifying its instrument and analyzing it in relation to Rossetti's work, I want to argue that lovers listening to music actually predates some of Rossetti's own interests in capturing music in a visual format. So my paper today, as I said, anchors around one central work, and that is lovers listening to music. There are two versions in favor of a clearer digital presentation, knowing it was going to be, I mean, the work itself is quite small, but knowing it was going to be the big. I have the version from the Ashmolean Museum, which is pen and brown ink on off-white paper. First of all, what do we see? In a seemingly British landscape, complete with rolling hills, which was likely around Hastings, where Siddle visited around this time together with Rossetti, we see two people sitting on a bench, leaning against a wall. The woman leans against the man, her eyes are closed, her arms under her cheek. The man stares ahead, his mouth agape as if caught in mid-song. In front of them, on the left and on the ground, sit two women who both, with one hand, strum an instrument. To the right, next to the garden wall, and with one hand on its iron gate, stands a small child. A coat of arms decorates the gate, which itself leads into a densely forested wood. The title Siddle has chosen for her work gives us yet more information. The two figures on the bench are the listeners, and indeed they are lovers listening to music. The clothing appears nondescript. The child is dressed in a straight robe, immediately, I press too fast, immediately reminiscent of The Girlhood of Mary Virgin by Rossetti of 1849. All the women wear floor-length robes, the man wearing a tunic over tight trousers, the style of the work, simple lines, a hint of medievalism, is characteristic of Siddle's contemporary work, such as Clerk Saunders or the near contemporary Pippa Passes. Deborah Cherry has described Siddle's work of this time in the 1850s as archaizing and medieval. And uh, while Pamela Gerrish Nunn and Jen Marsh have described her style at this point and time as outline drawing, with Pippa Passes in particular, like Clerk Saunders, being derived from a literary subject. It was Nunn and Marsh who even suggested a specific location for lovers listening to music. Lovers seat on a cliff between Fairlight and Hastings. Their interpretation rests on the couple being a self-representation of Siddo and Rossetti, with the child then symbolizing the figure of love. They don't, however, comment on the musicians. While in terms of size and finish, being a fitted comparison or even a companion to Pippa Passes, lovers listening to music seems to rest on no literary subject at all. Hence, I want to extend our analysis of lovers today beyond these comparisons and include a close reading of its subject on a different level to images of music making in general. The first step is trying to identify the instrument. Again, I realize I've tried to close, do a close up of the instrument just so you can have a look, but it's a little blurry. My suggestion is that it is a psaltery, an ancient stringed instrument, family of the harp, and played by strumming or plucking action. It is considered a forerunner of the harp the virginal, the clav clavichord, and the harpsichord, as well as the medieval zither and dulcimer, with numerous of the instruments in this list being more broadly popular in pre-Raphaelite painting. Psalteries were mostly trapezoidal or triangular and richly decorated. However, they didn't need to be. They existed in rectangular form as well, and despite I initially thought it might have been a monochord, but in the name, monochord only has one string, and psalteries have a limited number of strings, I think it is a psaltery virtue of the number of strings while also lacking a fretboard. Indeed, Rossetti actually developed an interest in the family of the psalteries later on. He used an upright psaltery in, with a keyboard combination in the blue closet of 1857. He used a Japanese goto, which is a family of the psaltery in a seed spell of 1875-77. And in 
and uh, a cradle psaltery, which is actually really ironic because the way she's holding it, there won't really be much sound because her arms are crushing the strings. He also often likes, that's a different discussion for another time, before I go off, <laughs> he often paints them wrong, that is a conclusion. Um, but the famous literary reference for the psaltery would of course be Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, specifically Nicholas the Gallant in the Miller's Tale, Visual references could include a physical reconstruction of a psaltery. We know Rossetti owned a couple of instruments, also reconstructed instruments when he passed away in 1882, but there is no telling, and I can't take that for granted, that this was the case in the 1850s and that Siddle would have had access to them. They could also have been part of the visual exhibits of the Great Exhibition of 1851. Other sources can include medieval illustrations or altarpieces held in the National Gallery. The psaltery is often mentioned in Christian contexts as a simple 10-stringed instrument, though number of strings can vary. I still want to propose it as a psaltery, simply by virtue of, as I said, its fretboardless structure, the number of strings, and the plucking rather than strumming action by the musicians. An interesting point of comparison would be the visual effect between Siddle's Lovers and Rossetti's The Tune of the Seven Towers of 1857, which also featured a psaltery, a really strange one in this case, because as you can see, the psaltery is attached as a string instrument to a keyboard that claps over her knees. Both works predicate themselves on the action of listening, but in different degrees. The listeners gaze abstractedly into space, in seven towers, in a very crowded, materialistically heavy environment, while in lovers in a natural, open landscape. There are allusions to love in both works, in the title and gestures of lovers, and the branch of the orange tree as symbolic of marriage in seven towers. Yet the reaction to music is so markedly different. In lovers, we perceive a calm, peaceful reception of the sound in Lyot with its natural surroundings, while in, that, in Seven Towers we see concerned faces and melancholic gazes. The music seems more distressing than calming in this composition. Even the psaltery, as I mentioned, is unexpected, since it lowers over the legs of the musician trapping her. Uh, can the instruments in both, however, be read as instruments of love? In lovers, certainly, the instrument becomes a facilitator of the feeling of love between the two listeners as performed by the musicians. And indeed, I want to say that musicians play a central role in lovers. Without them, no sound. Visual analyses of lovers listening to music so far has relegated the two musicians to the sidelines. Um, referred to by William Michael Rossetti as simply Malay looking, and by some scholars as Egyptian, and again by others as simply Oriental, virtually no scholarly attention has been paid to the two musicians who I argue in a piece that concerns the production of music fulfill a crucial role. As I said, without them, no sound. While it may seem difficult now to recover Siddle's own attitudes, towards race at that time, you must remember the Victorian context of the 1850s and specifically so close after the Great Exhibition, emphasizing the otherness of certain groups of people. The presence of white people in most artworks exhibited at this time and the generalized view of a hierarchy where the quote unquote Anglo-Saxon still stood at the top of an imaginary ladder. Yet the musicians drawn by Siddle are unlike Frederick Goodall's or John Frederick Lewis's or the representations of the Orient or even by William Holman Hunt's Orient in the Afterglow of Egypt, also of 1854. And as musicians, they are given a particular agency that is lacking in many other works. They are the active party in the composition, controlling the sound dynamic and the pace. And it is inevitable that Siddle reproduces a certain gaze here. Is she viewing these two musicians from an ethnic viewpoint? Is it to emphasize a power dynamic between musician and listener? Or is she exoticizing the role of the musicians? Which could be the case concerning that it's quite an antique instrument. But it is not an exotic instrument, though it carries, as I said, connotations of antiquity. The drawing doesn't even appear fully complete, which leads us into questions who sat for the figures, which I unfortunately don't have an answer to. What we can ascertain is that the difference between the musicians and the listeners and the power dynamic created creates a certain dynamic that we as audience have to pay attention to. Now, when the French composer Claude Debussy, later in the century, endeavored to translate Rossetti's The Blessed Damoiselle into music as La Demoiselle Élue, it was a theme of desire and love that he latched onto so strongly. Indeed, there's a reason why love and music are deemed compatible forces in Siddle's musical work of the mid-1850s, and why often Rossetti linked the two in his early musical work also. There's an overlap between the emotions brought on by music as overwhelming, powerful, and sensuous, and the feelings brought on by associative feelings of love, longing, and desire. The aspiration of love is deemed beyond ordinary language or rational thought, in much the same way as music is to be considered to be located in this realm beyond rational understanding and operating on the emotions only. Feelings of love and the experience of music meet in the playing field of Siddle's lovers in two ways, actually through a possible poetic source and the aesthetic attention vested in the visual composition itself. First, there has been the suggestion that Lovers is based on the passing of love, a poem by Siddle herself particularly the following stanza, and I read, Love kept my heart in a song of joy. My pulses quivered to the tune. 
the coldest blasts of winter blue, upon me like sweet airs in June. Particularly interesting about these lines of poetry is the suggestion of the relation between the rhythmic pounding of a heart and the rhythmic nature of music. The beating of a heart, the quivering of sensations, sensations experienced when listening are analogous to those experienced when in love or faced with an object of desire. This creates a mental correlation between love and music concentrated in this work, in the instrument and the act of listening. Listening as an act of subjective, temporal and interior attention appears similar to an aesthetic attention vested by someone in love. At this time, there was, from an aesthetic standpoint, a presumed universality of music, which was an extremely Eurocentric notion, as a direct conduit to the emotions, and that it somehow could do more than other arts could. Love, as something inexplicable, immaterial, and intangible, held the same role. Moreover, instruments, specifically those in the context of a ballad, a love song, or a serenade, could easily symbolize the role of love and desire, augmented by their performative and physical aspects. It makes us think, too, of the possibility of music as a tool of seduction, which I would argue is not the case in Lovers, but defi definitely the case in some of Rossetti's work, where a man plays the instruments such as morning music. Secondly, and I've hinted at this before, but I think we can read the use of the instrument in Lovers as a symbolic instrument of desire, a facilitator of the creation of love. Rossetti, in many of his musical works of a later date than Lovers listening to music, gravitated towards the same, such as the tune of the Seven Towers and its contemporary, The Wedding of St. George and Sabra. Underpinning the dynamic of listener and performer in all of these cases is the issue of gender. It is worth highlighting that the involvement of the women as musicians is very significant. While in the public sphere, think concert halls, orchestras, women were usually not allowed, unless you're of an op a higher class and you see an opera, for example, but like the rowdy houses where there's musical parties combined with drinking, women were usually not allowed. And women were also seen not to be proficient enough to even hold an instrument. So, but then, on the other hand, in the domestic sphere, it is mostly the women who do play the instrument. Um, women, in Isidro's work and almost all of Rossetti's musical works, it is always the woman playing the instrument. Like, just as Georgiana Byrne-Jones being proficient on the piano, the woman became inextricably associated with musical production. And this brings me to my last point. One very interesting feature I find of lovers listening to music is this. One of the musicians, the one on the left, holds one strand of her hair in her hands while she's strumming the instrument with her other. What is interesting is that this very feature of hair intertwined with instruments or hair in relation to sound, strings, and music has been pointed out extensively in the scholarship on Rossetti and music. But I actually want to propose that Rossetti and Siddle had a similar interest in this with much overlap and that Siddle predates Rossetti in uh, the visual composition of hair in relation to musical instruments. There's an increased tactility to the work. The way one of the musicians holds her hair and with the other hand strums the instrument suggests touch, movement, the similarity between strands and hair and the strings of sultry becomes an embedded touch, stimulating not only our own attention on the potential of music, but simultaneously on the very tactility and materiality of instruments. The first time, to my knowledge, that Rossetti incorporated the relation between hair and sound in a visual format is The Maids of Elfenmere of 1857, a later work than Siddle's Lovers. The Maze of Elfenmere was a tentative start to this tactile and visual relationship between hair, string, and sound. As the three maids string, uh, sing and hold their string, there is a confluence of string and hair. The touching of the hair is a manifestation of an interest in musical sensation, or even what you can call a physiognomy of performance. For Rosetta, this became, for Rosetti, this became a wider interest in the body in general, as evidenced in both his painting and his poetry. In a musical context, however, the physical performativity of the body is what captivated Siddle to draw her musicians as she did, and by extension, what would fascinate Rossetti in his own musical works. This also extended to Rossetti's treatment of hands, which Thomas already pointed out, which is visible in many of his works. An early work of Rossetti's that definitively incorporated the hair-sound relationship, which is very interesting because it's a man playing the instrument, is Morning Music of 1864. Um, in both the works, music is used as a facilitator of desire and association between string and hair, increasing the symbolic capacity of actions like caressing, feeling, and touching. The instruments draw attention to the analogy between body and action, even body and instrument, and reflects Rossetti's and Siddle's interests in strings in relation to strands of hair, an interest that Rossetti consequently would take much further than Siddle ever did. As I have endeavored to demonstrate today that Siddle not only predated one of Rossetti's musical interests, but that our interest in music and love ran much deeper than a surface viewing of lovers listening to music actually suggests. Their interest in the instrument as a tool of love and music as a love-inflected theme suggests their closeness in the 1850s. They took remarkably different approaches, with Siddle focusing on the listener-musician dynamic, while Rossetti inevitably became interested in the tactility of the instruments themselves. 
I'll, even though I think it is worthwhile to take a closer look at the role that instruments may play in visual compositions, what it suggests about tactility, and specifically audience dynamics, even audience participation, and what it ultimately can mean in a broader interdisciplinary network, including poetry, music, and the visual arts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marta, for that formidable argument and those effervescent series of close readings. Our final speaker of this morning's panel is Rosie Neenan, a third year PhD researcher in the School of English at the University of St. Andrews. To present her paper, Absorption is Not Annihilation, Kisses and Originality in Dante Gabriel Rossetti's Poetry and Art, please welcome Rosie. Thank you. Um, so this talk will be looking at absorption in the work of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's poetry and art, focusing on his kisses. So this talk looks for the role of kisses in formulating Dante Gabriel Rossetti's artistic practice. Kisses are a current theme throughout Rossetti's works. As Ernest Fontana argues, in Rossetti's poetry and art, the kiss assumes sacramental significance. Likewise, Elizabeth Gitter has observed that in his work, the kiss is imagined as nourishing, as an erotic communion banquet, while David Bentley has equally acknowledged their importance in Rossetti's artistic development. Though undoubtedly aligned with Rossetti's interest in the art Catholic and sacramental, little has been said about his use of kisses to interrogate the act of creation itself. I will begin by dis discussing Dante Gabriel Rossetti's Paolo and Francesca di Romini, alongside Dante's dream at the time of, bit, time of death of Beatrice, before moving on to the sonnet The Kiss, part of his House of Life sonnet sequence, and ending with the painting Bocca Bacciata. I aim to demonstrate Rossetti's negotiation between literary influence and his desire for originality, and ultimately reveal the resolution Rossetti finds, a vision of sustaining absorption in enabled through the kiss. As Rossetti wrote in a letter to William Bell Scott in 1871, I cannot suppose that any particle of life is extinguished. Absorption is not annihilation. Inherently collaborative and deeply intertextual, the kiss, as both symbol and gesture, explores the meeting of influence and sensation and the movement between art and life. To envision art in terms of the kiss is to accept its inherently collaborative nature, with kisses necessitating a meeting of difference. Rossetti's watercolour, Paolo and Francesca di Romini, um, with Dante in the centre, exemplifies these meetings. The work can be read as directly demonstrating the slippage between originality and replication. Taking from Canto V of the Inferno, the triptych features a kiss between the adulterous lovers Paolo and Francesca, a kiss which itself is echoed or foretold by the manuscript they hold. In the Inferno, Paolo and Francesca are first absorbed in the text they read, which tells of the love between Lancelot and Guinevere before becoming absorbed in each other. The illuminated literary kiss leads to a kiss between Paolo and Francesca, which cannot be severed, one which binds them together in hell. Here, the kiss seemingly compels its replication. Dante equally is absorbed into the work, while the manuscript illustration is imagined as being re-embodied through the painting, creating a nesting of influences. Literary and visual kisses both invoke their own recreation, imagined as almost contagious acts, spread from body to body and work to work, borrowed yet renewed in each iteration. But here there is the threat of a kind of totalizing absorption, one which is signified through both Dante and Hell. Rossetti returns to Dante in his Dante's dream at the time of death of Beatrice, which, though influenced by the Vita Nuova, departs from the text through the imagined kiss. As Rossetti wrote in his description of the painting, Dante is led by love and walks conscious but absorbed as in sleep, while love bends for a moment over Beatrice with the kiss which her lover had never given her. Rossetti can be said to grant the kiss to Dante, creating a reciprocal movement between the two painters and poets. Here, in contrast to the dense vision of absorbing kisses of Paolo and Francesca, Rossetti creates 
through the imagined moment, a kind of interspace, a gap he fills with a kiss. The paintings display the inherently self-conscious nature of Rossetti's kisses, always aware of their own literary origins, while equally together serving as a negotiation of the dual processes the kiss operates, being an act which both replicates and recreates, from which necessitates difference, even as it signifies union and tradition. Of course, Dante Rossetti's own personal identification with Dante Alighieri makes these slippages all the more complex. As a boundary act, concerned with the liminality of the mouth, the kiss always operates with the potential to both establish and eradicate bounds. The paintings usefully demonstrate how, for Rossetti, kisses are emblematic, then, of the act of creation itself. They equally, moreover, reveal how, for Rossetti, love, art, and the body are inex inexorably bound, as he writes in his notes under the head of To Art, I love thee ere I loved a woman, love. Kisses thus allow Rossetti to engage with both the literal and the figurative at once as a symbol of the universal and a literal act open to particularization. Rossetti's poetic kisses are similarly concerned with detailing their own creation and absorption. These kisses are arguably their most complex in his sonnets and throughout his House of Life sonnet sequence, first published tentatively in 1870 and more formally in 1881. Rossetti would reduce the volume of kisses in his later version due to the fleshly school scandal, as Robert Buchanan declared with Rossetti's sensual nuptials sleep in mind, Mr. Rossetti is never so great as on kisses and beds. These kisses are undoubtedly erotic and often sexual, but equally maintain a complex and enhanced engagement with the kiss through their intertextuality. The sonnet, a form so synonymous with the kiss, imbues these gestures with a heightened sense of reflexivity, a sense felt in Barrett Browning's sonnets from the Portuguese, but pushed further in Rossetti's dense poetry. As Eric Gray argues, by the 19th century, both the sonnet and the sonnet kiss had become not only overdetermined, but defunct, part of a tradition which was now a dead body that needed to be revived. Rossetti's sonnet kisses attempt to renew and resurrect the defunct kiss in a manner which echoes the recursiveness found in Paolo and Francesca da Rimini and the break of Dante's dream. These kisses were often still overdetermined, full of intricate fullness, as they grapple with poetic influence and personal invention. Rossetti's choice to divide his sonnets, to leave a gap between the octave and sesta, formally exhibits his grappling with influence and his own experience. Rossetti acknowledges this duality when he writes in the sonnet that a sonnet is a coin, its face reveals the soul, its converse to what power it is due. Like kisses, sonnets both reveal their individual identity and their origins. He too merges the face of the sonnet with the face of his beloved in The Secret Parting, writing, And as she kissed, her mouth became her soul. Women in his sonnets, as in his art, merge with form. The aptly named sonnet, The Kiss, demonstrates Rossetti's attempts at balancing these competing impulses. The first lines are unexpectedly pathological, invoking death, sick decay and seizures. The deathliness can certainly be read as erotic, but it also calls upon the extreme self-consciousness of the sonnet and the sonic kiss. The reference to Orpheus emphasizes the self-aware indebtedness of the po poetic tone of the first half of the sonnet, which is clearly preoccupied with itself as engaging in the conventions of, it, of the sonnet. Like Dante in the paintings I've discussed, Orpheus is a metonym of poetic inheritance. The kiss, as an interlude, seems to fall between the beloved and the speaker, between sound and sensation, an act which is both present and absent in its overfulness. The octave begins with death and ends with deathly longing. Poetic inheritance signified through the figure of Orpheus overshadows the sonnet's earlier attempts at personalization. It robs and denudes by stripping away the specificity to replace it with the spectral, the form of the sonnet seems to falter when looked back upon. The speaker is almost unable to overcome the generality implied by the title and the poetic legacy of the defunct poetic kiss. 
Even if read as biographical, full of Rossetti's own longing for Elizabeth Siddall, the lines are strikingly impersonal, self-consciously concerned with their own musicality and emptiness, half-drawn even. Yet the kiss in the sestet moves back towards the personal of the eye and towards a more fleshly and erotic coupling. The half-drawn kiss becomes one which reifies as her touch moves him from a child to a man to a spirit to a god, ending with the absorbing unity of fire within fire, desire and deity. The earlier emptiness is inverted as longing is replaced by a vision of absorption and fullness. Jennifer Wagner argues that Rossetti's sonnets are concerned with the revisionary moment, literally a re-seeing of experience. Through reenacting and re-seeing, Rossetti's sonnet kiss is enacted fully and able to marry tradition and experience, the symbolic and literal, through a dialectical approach which finds a kind of synthesis in the absorbent and absorbing kiss. As Paolo Moret writes, in kissing, lovers simultaneously transcend their own bodies and devour one another, because in kissing they themselves become the kiss. The notion of becoming the kiss is key to the sonnet and to how Rossetti imagines, through the necessary bringing together of parts, how it creates something beyond the self even as it involves it, creating something beyond the past even as it involves it. The octave and sestet may even be imagined as like lips, with the visual gap of the volta creating the very distance and bounds that allow kisses to occur. J.B. Bulling views absorption as threatening in Rossetti's work, arguing that again and again in Rossetti, absorption into the female principle involves annihilation of the self. Certainly this can be the case, but in Rossetti's kisses, he often finds a kind of sustaining of self. Even in the kiss, the image of fire within fire suggests a form of absorption which does not obliterate, but instead contains. Rossetti's Bocca Bacciata, or the mouth that has been kissed, can be understood in relation to the sonnet and Rossetti's sonnets more generally, reenacting its breaks. Described by Rossetti as a rapid study of flesh painting, it signaled a move towards the more overtly erotic and decorative, a focus on the superficial. Mod modeled on Fanny Cornforth, her full red lips would come to typify Rossetti's stunners. There is something enigmatic about the image. As Francis Dickey argues, Rossetti's subject inhabits a strange state in between absorption and engagement, and it is often said that she is absorbed with herself. She thus embodies the self-conscious and self-involved counters of Rossetti's sonnets. The painting's name is taken from Giovanni Boccaccio's Decameron, a line of which is on the back of the picture and translates as, the mouth that has been kissed loses not its freshness, still it renews itself even as the moon does. The image itself, however, does not reflect itself in any obvious way, yet the text in relation to the image seems to reflect the painting's relationship to the original material, which is re-embodied. Rossetti's choice of title draws attention to the kisses that have been, even as he focuses on the renewal of the lips, reenacting the engagement between influence and creation. Like the sonnet, its face reveals the soul, its converse taught power to his due, a function here literalized. In Rossetti's focus on the de decontextualized body, it would seem he equally moves back towards absorption. However, the lines inscribed on the back of the painting pull the art back outwards, away from the insularity of the decorative body and towards the symbolic. Soul and influence align to create the kiss while leaving the lips renewed. Kisses are made both visible and invisible, inscribed on her lips in one sense while leaving her lips open for future work. Both picture and text exist together, absorbed and absorbing without one annihilating or superseding the other. Each kiss calls back to each kiss that has been before, both new and old. As Rossetti writes in her heaven, in every kiss sealed fast to feel the first kiss and forebode the last. There is equally an openness which invokes a form of relationality with the viewer, a kind of gap which beckons new meetings. Rossetti's double works, which generally take the form of poems written to accompany his paintings, similarly replicate this meeting. As Jerome McGann writes, all these works cultivate a dialectic of doubled construction, whereby the integrity of the individual element is preserved. Thus, these works I've explored on kisses in themselves enact the doubling and construction, which can be said to typify the process of Rossetti's double works, a practice of expansion and absorption. 
Bocca Bacciata itself is a double work, linked to Rossetti's poem, The Song of the Bower, which was originally named after the painting. The lyric is about a longing for an absorption with the beloved, and thus a longing for absorption into art, as the lover recalls the kiss of his beloved in which the world melts away. Read in conjunction, then, the poem and painting together create a fruitful, expansive confluent of kisses and meetings and mouths, pairs of doubles which meet in desire and longing, breaking apart so that new encounters may be had. In conclusion, through his exploration of kisses, Rossetti reveals the beauty and significance of absorption as a transformative and unifying force, ultimately reaffirming that within the embracing of artistic influence, individuality and originality can thrive and flourish. Thank you. J.B. Bullen's striking points on absorption and danger. So it's actually going to be my first question. Thinking about the idea of close reading and the act of close looking, I wondered how much each of you would respond to the provocation that to close read and to close look is to let yourself be absorbed, to risk a kind of absorption and annihilation, almost a sort of fraternization with the text or the image. Go for it. Um, thanks. For the, I mean, it's a fascinating question. Perhaps we will have slightly different but mm. similar experiences. Um, with Le Gill and Data, it, it has kind of filled me and taken over. But at the same time, there is this curious vacancy to the figure, which, um, which you just mentioned. At the same time, which brings you, which makes you kind of perplexed. Um, and I think that, for me, is one of the hallmarks of, of um, well, that's what makes it such a, a great painting. Um, but I think close looking and close reading probably run the risk of doing the opposite, um, of projecting, or not projecting, that's probably too kind of on the nose word, but you know, maybe run the risk of being slightly violent in over-determining something. And so there's a push and pull. Um, there's a dialectic, if you want to put it like that. There's a process. And for me, it's embodied as well. So it's quite important to go and see the picture. And um, that one is in London. It was in a free, free entry gallery, the Guildhall. And now it's here in Tate. So the process takes place over time. And it's push and pull over time. It's imaginative, but it's also embodied. I would say. I suppose, I mean, for me, music comes into it very much where if I were to look at a painting that is about music, it's almost the time that you take to get absorbed into it in simulacrum of the time taken to enjoy a piece of music, where over time you have to make sure through sustained attention that you pay attention to what you're looking at, what you're listening at. Um, but yeah, as you say, it is a sense of trying to be, specifically when seeing it in person, like, that was kind of the discrepancy I had with giving this presentation because the work by Siddle is so small. So it's very delicate and here it's blown up huge and it makes a huge difference to how we experience the work. I think um, it relates back to Dante Rossetti's Willowwood sonnets and this idea of kind of being so close to something that you almost can't see it anymore and it just becomes this kind of very absorbing moment and at the end, he sort of finishes those sonnets by drinking from the well. So it's almost like it just becomes something that becomes part of you, so there's not really that distance anymore. Oh, brilliant. Thank you very much. I'd love to open the floor to questions. appreciate we've had a very different talk. Yes, right at the back there. Forgive me if I can't tell who it is. It's me again. Um, <laughs> thank you for three really interesting papers. Um, and I was really... I don't know if this was done on purpose, but it's sort of a couple of things you've just said in that first question and this idea of annihilation. Um, for Thomas in particularly, I was interested in, um, that talk made me think about um, Tennyson's geological stanzas, um, primarily around um, the idea of evolution. And then you mentioned the violence of this over-determination sometimes, but also the slow process of building up these close readings through that idea. And I'm wondering um, 
just from a position of not knowing Rossetti's writings that well. Um, is there anything that you've come across in relation to this idea of changing forms, merging forms, that ecological question in the Gilan data um, around any of the discomforts with evolution or any of that sort of relationship to Tennyson's verses around, you know, nature is red in tooth and claw, the annihilation of species, of forms, anything along those lines in relation to that? Yeah, I mean, um, thanks, Melissa. Um, I take the attitude that um, it's slightly an artificial exercise to hunt and then seize upon quotations which corroborate close reading and contextualization like that. But I have one. <laughs> and um, it's a stray piece of prose. That's all I really know about it, collected by William Michael in a kind of miscellaneous list of his brother's sayings. And it, it goes like this. Picture and poem bear the same relation to each other as beauty does in man and woman. The point of meeting where the two are most identical is the supreme perfection. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I have kind of, I've got that up my sleeve, but in all seriousness, I take that as indication that he's thinking about um, gender fluidity, however you want to put it. More than that, I think transformation in our terms between man and woman. As for how that, whether that connection with the evolutionary thought about transformation at the time was made in Rossetti's mind. I, I'm arguing that it was. I mean, Le Guillain Data, he paints at Kelmscott just as Descent has been published. You know, he's, everybody's reading it. And it's being discussed widespread. And like I said, there's, um, there's a curious um, sense in Darwin that he's really um, disavowing the radical implications of his own theory in terms of heteronormativity and non-heteronormativity in Descent and the other texts. But yeah, running right the way through Darwin's texts is a real queer thread. And um, I think there's ample evidence and um, interpretive bandwidth to, to, to suggest that Rossetti was engaging with that. That's what I would say. I'm not sure about the Tennyson passages you mentioned, but I'd be interested to know more, so thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, yes, I think it's Imogen Hutt. Thank you. Um, I have a question for all the speakers. I'd like to invite you to say a bit more about the specific materials that the artists are working with and um, to, to tell us more about how in your close readings of the types of relation you're talking about, the artist processes and the particular materials um, might, be, might be playing an important part. Thanks. I think it's a good question. Um, <laughs> don't know, like with Siddle's with, with drawing, which is pen and brown ink on off-white paper, I haven't really considered the materiality of it in relation to its content. Um, I know that she worked a lot at the time to make, for like her style of outline drawing, pen and ink would be a beneficial and a good choice. But no, I haven't given it much thought, so I need to give it more thought before I come back to you. I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, I think I mainly think about the materials in terms of textual material. So I suppose I haven't looked at the paintings themselves and sort of developed how they were constructed. So I think that's something I could definitely look at in more depth. One thing that comes to mind is conventionally, um, watercolor might be, might tend towards a registering with a feminine gender versus the masculinity of oil. And that might be one thing to mm. think through. Mm. Um, I was also thinking with oil painting, you get the dimension of richer color than you would with pen on paper. Um, so with Rossetti, very often, specifically William Michael and F.T. Stevens describe his color as being musical, just by virtue of them being very deep, rich colors, which you don't get in Siddle's uh, drawing. Mm. Can I suggest something? You're talking about Siddle's work, pen and ink. What is 
music usually written in pen and ink on paper? You know, if you're writing music. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, a fair, fair point, yeah. I yes. guess. Sorry. Sorry. No, 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 I, it, it would be the same material, yes. Brilliant. Thank you for that generative question, Imogen. We, yes. Tim Barron. Thank you all for a fascinating um, talks, and I just wanted to ask the first two speakers to reflect a little more on themes of the exotic in relation to empire, you know, thinking of where Darwin went to find stuff, to see these, these examples of what seemed to be the monstrous, um, and to obviously to look at the, the musicians again in terms of a sort of cluster of ideas around the exotic, uh, the, the, the primitive, and the monstrous. Um, mm -hmm. So could the music in Siddle's uh, uh, drawing be you know, grotesque as well as beautiful? Mm -hmm. um, and is there a kind of imperial grotesque imperial monstrousness in the Darwinian foliage uh, in, in the Ghirlandata. So it, is there a sort of cluster of ideas of, <clears throat> you know, otherness, which is both um, exciting and thrilling and uh, even erotic, but also horrifying uh, in, uh, across both of these works, and perhaps even in some of the poetry that we heard in the, in the third paper? That's an excellent question. I think... I don't know if I would use the word grotesque but or something monstrous, but there is a way of... You have it more with Rossetti than with Siddle, a way of appropriation where musical instruments, specifically when Rossetti was very keen with Japanese kotos, and in the blue closet... No, the blue bower. What was it again? I think the blue closet. Blue bower. Yeah. I'm so sorry, sorry. I wrote a paper on this. I should know this. <laughs> the one from 1865, where the woman is sitting in the bower. Koto, the bower, that's the one. <laughs> Um, so sorry, and she has a koto in front of her, but you would never have a koto in front of you on a table, and she's strumming it wrong, and <laughs> they have, this happens very often in Rossetti's paintings with instruments that he doesn't really care to make them look, even though he has the instrument itself, so it has to be deliberate choice to paint them wrong. But you see, I think this especially with instruments that come from other nations, such as the koto, and then it is an act of kind of trivializing what the instrument itself the instrument itself, or even being dismissive of what the instrument itself acts as, and rather using it as a prop to have the hand sit in a certain way, or to have the body sitting in a certain way. Um, and I, I think also with Siddle's psaltery, while considered like a kind of European instrument, it's, it's so simplified that you can easily think of like Indian santours, or like I said, the Japanese koto, and kind of the simplification of the instrument to just this one specific action. Um, yeah, maybe it is an exoticizing of, of, of the type of music that they would be producing. I mean, with the number of strings, it would be considered quite simple music, um, yet beautiful. And I don't know if I would say something monstrous about it, but I think there's, there's yeah, there's something there. Does that make sense? That's very interesting. I would, I would quickly add before returning to the question that in the Gale and Data, the, the musical instrument is backwards. Mm. Um, and her hair is in the strings. Well. Yeah, so that's being, you know, the, the monstrosity is coming out through mm. the kind of, like, incorrect uh, depiction of it. But uh, in answer to Tim's question, I would talk about the blue dackness. There's a bird um, in the top right um, of the painting. And the rest of it is kind of English. They're English flowers, at the very most European. It's a European painting if the musical instrument is vaguely alluded to these things. It's also kind of drawing, I think, quite strongly on English poetic, imaginative imagery. But the blue darkness, the bird, is a um, South American bird. And it's the only kind of exotic thing in there, though the whole thing is exoticized, made grotesque. The bird isn't grotesque, but it comes from South America, which I, I really think was still associated in the Victorian imagination with Darwin and his voyages of the Beagle. And he does have passages about lurid, wondrous metamorphosis in, in the Beagle. So it's a way of thinking about um, you know, um, English expeditions abroad, even extractions of um, exotic um, things and resources from those places. And Rossetti and Christina, of course, had that menagerie. And there is a letter where Dante Gabriel writes to his assistant saying, send me that, send me that blue bird I have at Chelsea. 
which must refer to the tanager, or maybe he was experimenting with different ones, but it's related. So there's a sense that, yeah, of plunder, but also an exoticization um, being integrated into this strange, monstrous, beautiful thing, but at the same time, an engagement with the capacities of all nature to um, flatten difference, uh, a kind of equality, or there are kind of equalizing implications there as well. So it's ambivalent, I would say. I mean, this, what you've just said is so interesting. Both of you have said is so interesting. If we think of what nature might mean, I think nature to Ruskin was naturalized in a very different way from this sort of over exuberant tropical, you know, eroticized nature that you see in La Gil and Data. And that's kind of played out in the Siddle with the two figures of imperial otherness in the foreground. And then this very English fair light gap in the background with this very precise sort of more like Millet Holman Hunt vision of what and Ruskin vision of what nature could be in the background. So it's, it's really fascinating that the same concept can go into such radically different directions. It's, it's one of those sort of schisms in pre-Raphaelitism, I think, as to what you, what you take nature to be. Um, so you, you've re both revealed that. Thank you very much. Do you have anything to add on the, the monstrous <coughs> and the primitive? Um, I suppose there is a sense that these kisses can be quite transformative in Rossetti's works. And I suppose, um, in general, there is kind of this idea of sort of potential effeminacy linked to kisses because they're not a gendered act in a lot of ways and like um, traditionally a lot of kiss poetry was kind of derided as being too effeminate and I think you can see that in um, Robert Buchanan's criticism of the Fleshly School he sort of spoke about how like both the men and women in these poems are like slathering and biting and he sort of focuses on this kind of like lack of oral differentiation between the two genders here. So you have this kind of sense that the mouth itself can be kind of quite monstrous in the way it allows these boundaries to become more fluid. Um, particularly with kissing, there isn't this kind of... There is a gender parity, I guess, created, an equalising element where both people come together in a similar way. Um, yeah. You raise a lovely point, which is... Um... Buchanan's fleshly school of poetry seems to circle around the mouth. Yes. He talks about Rossetti's women being women who uh, bite, slather, yeah. bubble, scratch. Munch. Munch, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and these strange ways for a, a very normal man to write about women. Um, and a fascinating piece of work. Do we have any other questions? Yes, Carol. Um, this is for everyone, but I'm thinking um, all your papers really made me think of the little drawing for Lilith that's in the exhibition, where the full body of the woman, and that is an extraordinary kiss that's described in the poem that goes with Eden's Bower, um, with this amazing phrase, lip me and listen. Um, but that's, you know, they're, they're the full body, naked body of the woman, and the full body of the snake are completely sort of part of each other. And it seems to me that really speaks to some of your themes, that you, especially what you were just talking about. Um, and, um, and that phrase that Rosetta used, which I think is from correspondence with somebody else, uh, Margaret has written about this, um, she might remember his name, um, the perilous principle of the world being female in the first. Uh, so that sort of, um, I think that's pre um, the descent of man, but those sort of those ideas were sort of washing around at that time. You know, obviously, as the woman, as um, a less specialised and evolved uh, um, um, form of creation uh, than man. Yeah, I believe it's in a letter to Thomas Hake, They're talking about Lady Lilith, yeah. and I think he describes her as the first modern woman in a separate space that opens up all kinds of conversations. Is your response? I think it's a great point I, um, to think about Lady Lilith and um, in relation to, to transformation and Ligiel and Data. I, um, I suppose there's also, drawing slightly on that, the point about Rossetti's type, this kind of um, fulsome, abundant, I think you said yesterday, Nicholas, <laughs> large, featured... Um, ostensibly female figure. 
who um, reappears again and again in, in Rossetti, who um, uh, takes characteristics from a number of models, but seems to be an amalgamation of those individual models as well, an assembly, or a kind of transformation of those individuals into something, something else. Um, so I would, I would probably want to talk about that. And I was just um, struck that, Rasheen, you spoke about individuality at the end of your, your paper as well, um, which is very intriguing, because um, Rossetti, as you're saying, is all about these kinds of um, transformations between values. You can't have the one without the other. And yet, we were both kind of moved to articulate an individuality the presence of that as well, which is really interesting. And I, I'm not quite sure I've thought that fully, fully through. Yeah. I think also with that image, there's just this like, very intense tactility, which I think runs through um, Dante Rossetti's work and sort of like this idea of the body itself sort of being something that's so tied to his art and poetry and how it's read. And sort of like the reading of the body relating to the reading of the text. Um, really. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you very much for that. And Lilith is a wonderful example. Yes, Suzanne. Thank you. Um, Thomas, I, you mentioned the quotation from Pater, and I was wondering what you were just saying about these women being an amalgam, whether they are in fact what Pater is talking about as the Frankenstein uh, monster that they you know the thing that has taken them over are the these different women who have entered his life mm. um, I mean there was at that point quite a, a lot of critical focus on the bodies of the women uh, and the names of those women the biographies of those women and I wondered whether they were <laughs> what Pater was referring to in that quotation you mean the, mo the models yeah yeah, partly, I think so. Um, he's saying, really, he's pursuing an argument that, well, he's responding to the criticism. And a lot of the criticism struggles with Rossetti's women. You know, they're kind of repulsed, very uneasy. Um, and time and again in the criticism, what pops up is this idea that Rossetti has emasculated himself, that these... Um, dominating, transfixing women are actually taking on some of his own creative agency in a rather um, improper and troubling way. It's something that Buchanan is probably driving at as well and also kind of trying to belittle. And, um, and Pater is, is picking up on that and transforming it. Um, but he also ultimately does present Rossetti as this kind of male genius. Um, so he says that, you know, the creations, the Ghirlandatas, the Boccabacciatas, he's talking about the paintings as well, that the, crea the creations kind of take on a life of their own, and vampire-like, you know, take, draw, draw on Rossetti's blood. Um, but he, he's so clever because in his review, he ends up kind of reinscribing Rossetti as this modern genius. Um, so he is very much, I think, Peter, responding to all of that talk about Rossetti's women, Rossetti's models, and flipping it on its head a little bit. What a lovely transgressive note to end on. Um, I'm delighted to say we now have a comfort break until noon, but please join me once again in thanking our free speakers, Thomas Hughes, Marcus Thomas, and Thank you. Thank you.